Um, our final speaker for the evening uh, is here on a once a decade trip to the UK. So the um, chances of that happening on this evening were quite extraordinary, um, as is the man himself. He lives between um, San Francisco, oh, sorry, California and um, Japan. Um, he has, was very notably um, voted one of the 100 visionaries worldwide who could change your life. Um, he's here to talk to us this evening about his book, The Global Soul, and uh, about a very long conversation he has had with the Dalai Lama. Please welcome Pico Iyer. Uh, thanks very much. I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be in this amazingly funky creative space. Uh, there were no singing inflatable rats around when I was growing up in England. Uh, and I'm so happy to be in this scintillating company. My only small sadness is that once upon a time, we were hoping that the eminent uh, editor of the Evening Standard, Georgie Gregg, would be with us today. And we'd, I'd been asked to talk about a visionary, and I was actually going to talk about Geordie, uh, because I've known him since he was 11 and I was 12, playing on his uh, parents' lawn in Hampshire. And I was planning to disclose all kinds of, um, you know, the secret life of a huge press lord. But in his absence, as you just heard, uh, somebody suggested that I talk about the Dalai Lama because I have been lucky enough to know him since I was 17 because my father, who is a philosopher, sailed all the way back from England to India to meet him as soon as he came out into exile from Tibet in 1959. So the Dalai Lama goes into a bar. <laughs> Actually, that's what I would have said about Geordie. I, I'll have to erase that. But... I should say at the outset, I'm not a Buddhist. I don't, of course, speak Tibetan. I'm probably the opposite of a monk. I'm a profane journalist. So you shouldn't really listen to anything that I say. But one thing that's so interesting about this Dalai Lama, unlike any other in history, is, of course, that he spent so much time in places like this, talking to people like us who may have no knowledge of and no interest in Buddhism, which he always says is a really good thing. When he comes to places like London, he always tells people, please don't become Buddhists. Stay within your own traditions or lack of traditions where your roots are deepest and where there's the least danger of misunderstanding. Of course, you can learn something from a Buddhist, and a Buddhist can certainly learn something from you, but there's no reason to take on his whole tradition. And in a globe that sometimes seems ever more polarized, I think this kind of anti-missionary spirit is really intriguing. Uh, when the Dalai Lama comes to England, I think as much as anything, he's coming in order to learn about our traditions. Uh, famously, as some of you may know, he gave a whole set of lectures on the Gospels to a group of Christians, not very far away from here, because he felt he ought to know about Jesus. Uh, he's called himself a defender of Islam. And I think the single greatest passion he has is talking to scientists, many of whom, of course, will proudly say that they have no religion at all. Uh, a few years ago, an interviewer was talking to the Dalai Lama, and he said, well, let's talk about religion. And the Dalai Lama said, no, let's not. We have too many religions in the world. Let's talk about human beings. That's what we really need. Uh, and I was sort of nicknaming uh, in my head what I might say today as the 10 things you don't know about the Dalai Lama, but 10 things, of course, would take 10 hours. But I do think that, like any public figure, in some ways he's so enshrouded in myths and misconceptions that the more we see of him, often the less we know of him. And I think if I were to highlight just one misconception, it is that maybe people who've never seen him or never heard him talk think um, that he's a dreamer or an idealist. And I would say, from my experience, he's a hyper-realist. He's probably the most pragmatic person I've ever met. And that's partly in keeping with his tradition, uh, because the Buddha, as probably you know, always thought of himself as a scientist, almost like uh, Isaac Newton, a kind of empiricist, first trying to see what the laws of nature are, and then trying to see what we could do within them. And the Dalai Lama always follows what he calls his boss very scrupulously in that. He says over and over that for him at least, science always trumps faith. And that if new scientific research shows, for example, parts of Tibetan Buddhism to be out of date or inaccurate, throw out those parts of Tibetan Buddhism. And he's actually done that. There are, for example, old Tibetan scrolls that show the sun and the moon as equidistant from the earth. And he says, well, we know that's not the case anymore. So I personally have no time for them. 
Uh, you heard that I live in Japan, and the Dalai Lama, to my good fortune, comes to Japan every November for about seven or eight days. And I always spend those seven or eight days traveling with him, and almost every day he'll give a big public lecture. And at the end of almost every lecture, somebody will get up from the audience in a really heart-torn, sincere way and say, what do you do if you have a really cherished dream and your dream is shattered? And the Dalai Lama always looks at that person very fondly and encouragingly and says, wrong dream. It's not the dream that's let you down, it's you that's let the dream down. In other words, you have to be really realistic and rigorous in fashioning those aspirations it's feasible to follow. You know, if your, if your dream is to marry Brad Pitt, it's not going to happen. If your dream is uh, to marry Joe Schmo, who may have graces that even Brad Pitt would envy, then it very well could happen. And I think you know, the second reason why he's such a realist is, of course, that he's been leader of his people since the age of four. So I think he's never had the luxury of being a wise man on a mountaintop just talking about the golden rule. Uh, when he was eight years old, he was already receiving envoys from FDR with really specific requests for the transportation of US supplies across Tibet during World War II. Uh, when he was 11 years old, he was surrounded by a civil war in his own palace in Lhasa, Tibet, hundreds of monks dying. When he was 15, uh, he was made full-fledged political leader of his people ahead of schedule and had to start dealing with Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai and the largest nation on earth. And so I think he's never really been in a position to entertain romantic or abstract solutions. I remember one time I was talking to him and he said, you know, I'm really addicted. <laughs> and of course, you know, I thought, what in the world could a Dalai Lama be addicted to, other than impermanence or interdependence or reality, you know, one of those core Buddhist ideas? He said, no, 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 no. He is addicted to the BBC World Service. Uh, and every morning when he wakes up at home at 3.30 to do his first four hours of meditation, he always has to listen to the news, he told me. Uh, and he follows the news, I think, much more closely than I and my journalist friends do. So since we've been asked to talk about transformation, I thought the natural way to sort of wind this up would be to talk about a few of the tiny ways in which maybe I've changed my thinking or changed my habits as a result of having spent 37 years now talking with him. And you'll notice they have nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with Buddhism, just very simple, everyday, practical things. And the first is pretty obvious, but I'd never really thought about it until I heard him say that these days we spend so much time working on our bodies and so little time working on our minds. And yet, if you think of it, your mind is much more integral to your well-being, to your happiness. Because you know, if your body is really buff and toned and your mind is weak, you're in trouble. Um, if your mind is strong, then even when your body is weak or wavering, you can sometimes get through. But it's so easy to forget that, I think. Um, a couple of years ago, my doctor told me, um, you should walk on a treadmill every day for 30 minutes. And as soon as he said it, I began doing it, and I'll probably do it till the end of my days. But if he had said, you should spend 30 minutes every day just sitting quietly in a room, clearing your head, being still, I'd have said, no way, you know, I don't have the time. And yet those 30 minutes of stillness would probably be much more helpful to me and the poor people around me than the minutes in the health club. Uh, the second idea that I sort of got from him is the notion that suffering is different from unhappiness. That, as he sees it, suffering is the nature of human existence. We're all, we hope, going to encounter old age. We're all certainly are going to encounter death. We'll all almost certainly encounter disease. But unhappiness is just the position you choose, or if you want, cannot choose, to bring to those conditions. In other words, happiness has much less to do with your circumstances than with your perception. And interestingly, that's very much in keeping with what science is beginning to find. Uh, researchers have discovered that when somebody is suddenly rendered paraplegic, she will usually report, after about a year of really difficult adjustment, that her life is no worse than it was before the accident. And if somebody suddenly wins 20 million pounds in the lottery, he will usually report, after a year probably of exaltation, uh, that his life is no better than it was before. You know, he's spending all his time with tax consultants and lawyers. Uh, he doesn't know who his real friends are anymore. He's moved into a posh neighborhood away from Peckham, and he doesn't feel comfortable there. Uh, and I like this sense that, in some ways, we have a little more power than we imagine. We're not 
totally hostage to conditions. And again, this is not a Buddhist idea. Some of you probably remember in school reading Hamlet and hearing Hamlet say, there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And of course, the old Stoics always used to say, it's not the conditions or circumstances of our life that really define them, it's our response to the circumstances. Um, this is beginning to sound a bit like a Sunday morning sermon, so I apologize. But um, the next point uh, is probably a little relevant to Peckham in the summer of 2011. And I think all the speakers already have spoken about our globally interconnected world, in which the destiny of every person is really contingent upon the destiny and doings of everybody else. And in that kind of world, if you hit somebody else, you're essentially only smashing yourself. You know, if if the US were to attack Iran tomorrow, one of the great losers in that would be the US, not just because they're doing themselves out of Iran's oil resources, but because all Iran's neighbors would probably rise up uh, with retaliatory thoughts. Uh, and in, this, in the context of China and Tibet, I, I always think it's interesting that the Dalai Lama tells Tibetans in Tibet, you should be really glad that you're part of the People's Republic of China and part of this formidable, fast-rising economic powerhouse. You should learn Chinese. You should actually learn Buddhism from Chinese teachers where they happen to be the best, well, best qualified. And he always conversely tells the government in Beijing, anything you do to help Tibet is going to help China in the long run, and anything you do to hurt Tibet is going to hurt China. And I know in my own life, I mean, just to take a petty example, if somebody writes a really devastating review of one of my books, I start ranting and raving, raving and fuming. And at some point, if I snap out of that, I think, well, the only person who's wasting time and energy and emotion on this is me. So even if I'm only thinking of self-interest, better you know, to think, turn my mind to something else. The final principle, which of course is related to all of these, and implicit in what we've been hearing from the other three speakers, is the sense that you change the world a little bit, not entirely, but more than we suspect, by changing the way you look at the world. When the Dalai Lama fled Tibet in 1959, I think everybody around the world saw it as a terrible loss. He'd, he'd lost his homeland, he'd lost the people he was born to rule, he'd lost really his seeming destiny. And yet he instantly, I think, saw it as an opportunity and realized that he could do things in exile. It would have been really, really hard to do in old Tibet, surrounded by centuries of tradition and ritualism. He could allow women in the Tibetan community to get doctoral degrees, as they never had before. He could bring Western science into his monk's curriculum. In fact, he could really bring the modern world into Tibet, which it desperately needed, and Tibet into the modern world for our great benefit. And most important, he could bring democracy to his people for the first time in their history. And almost the first thing he did when he came into exile was to make up a new constitution saying we should be ruled by a popularly elected government and we should impeach the Dalai Lama if need be. And as most of you know, six months ago, he formally deposed himself. And he said the future of Tibet shouldn't be in the hands of just one aging, mortal, fallible monk. It should be in the hands of the government um, that we have chosen. And of course, maybe he almost has to say this, but he's telling his people that even if you've lost common ground, as long as you've got common foundations, a common language or a common culture, common religion, the best parts of Tibet are alive, even if there's nowhere on the map that says Tibet. And as I see it, this really has wider implications, because by some counts, there are 220 million people in the world living in countries not their own, many of them, of course, here in Peckham. And that's an incredible number, because it means... If you take the whole population of Canada, and the whole population of Australia, and the whole population of Australia again, and the whole population of Canada again, and then double that, you still have fewer people than belong to this great floating tribe of the deracinated. And I think many people now are thinking, as he is implying, that home has less and less to do with a piece of soil than, than almost with a piece of soul, than with the values and friendships and you know, iTunes downloads you happen to carry with you wherever you happen to be, that home is not just where you happen to be born, it's really where you become yourself. Home is, is not where you sleep, it's where you stand. And again, in my own life, um, a few years ago, I was sitting in my family's home in California, and I looked out the window, and I noticed we were surrounded by 70-foot flames, one of those wildfires that regularly sweep through the Californian hills. And I narrowly escaped with my life, but within three hours, the fire had wiped out the house and literally every last thing in it. I, I had to go to an all-night supermarket to buy a toothbrush. And when I woke up the next morning, that toothbrush was the only thing that I had in the world. 
And I think fairly quickly, maybe as a result of spending time with the Dalai Lama, I thought, well, you know, I could spend a lot of time mourning all the things that I've lost, but probably more productive and beneficial would be thinking of some of the things I've gained. Uh, I noticed that I could live really lightly. I didn't need to replace most of the things I'd lost. I realized that you didn't need to be rooted in a physical construction as long as you were rooted inside yourself. Um, I actually became a novelist. I'd always secretly wanted to write novels, but I never had the nerve to do so. And I'd been going to Cuba lots and lots, and I'd got hundreds of pages of notes. I'd lost my notes. I still wanted to write about Cuba, so I took a plunge. I might have been too apprehensive to do otherwise. And the final thing I'll say, which comes from not just watching the Dalai Lama, but lots of people I know who follow the world closely but are not hostage to it, is just this idea of living not according to somebody else's idea of happiness, but your own. Uh, so 20 years ago, I was uh, living on Park Avenue in New York City. I had a great job writing for Time magazine in a 25th floor office in Rockefeller Center, and pretty much the life I might have dreamed of as a little boy. But I realized it wasn't um, the life I should have dreamed of once I you know, was 25 years old. So I left all of that to go to a two-room flat in Japan, where I still live. No bicycle, no car, no high-speed internet, no printer, no TV I can understand, no newspapers, no magazines. And it really seems the most luxurious life I can imagine. Every day lasts an eternity. And to me, it's just a small reminder of perhaps what the Dalai Lama is suggesting, which is that happiness is defined not by how much you have, but by how much you don't lack. Thanks very much. <laughs>